A Texas megachurch pastor has resigned following sexual misconduct accusations. A late Atlanta pastor concealed accusations of sexual abuse. The United Methodist Church has voted to allow LGBT A wealthy clergy. megachurch pastor is accused of grooming young men for sexual abuse. The church hired a former male stripper for a men's The Southern conference. Baptist Convention covered up widespread sexual abuse. The shaking has begun. 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 And God promised it in the scriptures. Let me read it to you from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 through 29. It says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape, notice the language, speaking about the children of Israel in the wilderness when they went to Mount Sinai. If they did not escape, who refused him who spoke on earth, this is when God was in the mountain speaking, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks in heaven. Speaking of our Lord. Whose voice then shook the earth, because when God spoke from Mount Sinai, the whole mountain quaked. Whose then voice shook the earth, but now... He has promised, it's a promise, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that, notice this, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. We're in a shaking, and you and I are being shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, notice this, let us have grace. What do we need grace for? So that you can keep on sinning? God forbid, how shall I continue in sin any longer if I am dead to sin? I'm just going to say this, because, and then I'll give you a little bit of disclaimer about where I'm going. The, The problem is some of you haven't died to sin yet. And you think God's okay with it. When we talk about being saved, what are you being saved from? Sin. Let me me be very blunt. God killed his son. Not for streets of gold. Not for houses. Not for jobs. Because of your sin. I just need you to hear that. Not so he can bless you. Because sin was killing you. And so what you've been saved from, you have been saved from sin. Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. Here's Here's why we need grace. By which we may serve God acceptably with, here you go, reverence and godly fear. One of the biggest issues with our sin problem is because there is no fear of the Lord. You can't find a person today that walks in the fear of the Lord. And because we don't find the fear of the Lord, we don't find wisdom either to live the life that God has called us because the fear of the Lord is the beginning place in which wisdom functions and operates. And so thinking ourselves that we are wise, we are becoming awfully foolish. And I'm not talking about the world today. That was last week. I can't even believe you come back after the message last week. But I'm talking about the church. We can throw our stones at the church, but I promise you we're in glass houses today throwing them. Because if we want to testify to the problems in culture, it's not the president, the political party. It's the church. Why must we serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear? Verse 29 tells it. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God, He is love. 
but he's also a consuming fire. He's mercy, but he's also justice. He forgives. Praise God. But he also condemns. He's sending some to heaven. And he's sending some to hell. You don't have to say nothing. It's okay. Part of my responsibility as your pastor, and it's Joy and I's extreme pleasure to do so, but is to pay attention to what is spiritually taking place in the world around us. And to expose those workings to you that you may align yourself effectively to push back on the works of darkness and seize the opportunities to be the light of Christ in this world. I take that role and responsibility, responsibility very serious, and I'm paying attention. I'm, I'm paying close attention to what is taking place. And today, I want to bring it back home, if you will. Peter declares with all boldness and assurance to us that judgment must first begin at the house of God. And if the righteous are barely saved, barely saved, what shall be the end of the ungodly? Before God is going to deal with this world, he's going to deal with this church, and we are in the season of being dealt with. I'll give this light disclaimer, and I'm not going to add any more to, you, to it, by the way. I'm just going to go today, and uh, you're just going to find your own reckoning in this word today. But what I'm about to say is obviously not comprehensive, but I'm going to talk about the church very matter-of-factly today. But there are some great churches in the city. We're not the only ones that love God. We love him more than most, but we're not, the, we're, not the only, we're not the only ones that love God, that are serving in our city, that are making a difference. There are some great churches in Tennessee. There's some Jesus lovers in this nation. And there's some great churches around this world. But by and large, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And we got sin in the camp. And we've been partying with sin in the camp rather than weeping. Some of the questions people will oftentimes ask is, will my dog go to heaven? It's rare that somebody says, I wonder if my neighbor's going to hell. Look not on their face, Lord. The church is God's gift to the world. The church is God's gift to the world. The church is what Jesus left behind. It is what he is building. The church is truly the lifeline to the world. But one of our biggest issues that we're facing right now is that the standard has been lowered. And God is not going to use a sick, broken church to save a sick, dying world. What would we invite people into? What would we invite them into? No, the standard has been lowered, and I feel it is my assignment to blow a trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm, Joel chapter 2, verse 1, and tell you that Jesus is coming. He is coming, and listen, he's going to get the issues dried up within the body of Christ through the hem of that garment if we'll reach for it. Are you with me? Because there is a type of church that he is coming for. Make no mistake about it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. If you're taking notes, I've got a bunch of scripture to come today. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Notice this. That he might, the cleansing takes place with the word for the purpose of presentation of her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be, here you go, holy and without blemish. God is coming back for a glorious church, beautiful and full of splendor. And that's just not spiritually speaking, guys. That's in functionality. That doesn't have... Spot or wrinkle, that means that they're not 
stained by sin. Come on, Pastor. Come on. We've been, we, we, we have left our first love. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 says this. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Ephesus. And he's not playing. I could easily say this. I could, I could, I could just easily say this. Nevertheless, I have this against you, Mosaic Church. Nevertheless, I have this against you, Church of America. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You're doing religion really good, but you're not doing relationship well. Right? You got some works going on, but you have forgotten intimacy. Hmm. Notice the condition. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. He's saying you're in a falling condition, church of Ephesus, because you've left your first love. What is the, what is the response? Repent. And do your first works? What if I don't want to? Well, he makes it clear. I will come to you quickly. I ain't waiting. I'm going to come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. I'm going to take away your platform. I'm going to take away your voice. I'm not going to let you reproduce what you are into someone that needs life in me. I'm going to take away your platform. I'm going to take away your voice. I'm not going to let you make a burning hot church lukewarm. Welcome to the family reunion. (laughs) Unless you repent. By and large, the church is walking around very much deceived. We can can put ourselves in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. Oh foolish mosaicans. (laughs) Making it up. Oh, foolish Galatians, notice what he said. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Who's been, who's been compromising your gospel? Who's been making you feel okay about doing wrong? Who, who, who's been telling you God is still moving when you still grooving? Hello? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been clearly betrayed among you as crucified? You know the death, burial, and the resurrection. You've confessed that. But you ain't obeying anything. And when your your obedience is an indication that you're under a doctrine of destruction. He says, bewitch. Somebody's playing witchcraft on you. That TikTok video may be doing it. Facebook could be doing it. The pulpit could be doing it. That's right. We have turned to the weak and useless lifestyles. Galatians chapter 4 verse 8 and 9 says, Before you Gentiles knew God, speaking of us, before we knew God, we were slaves to so-called gods that did not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? And how can I declare something like that in this place because here's truth from the year 2000 to 2020 there has been 20 million people exodus to church we are not winning come on, come on. there is a great falling away happening right now 20 million people we're even making terminology up for them deconstructionist they're going through processes of deconstructing the faith values that were once embedded into them, that they feel a church is no longer relevant, a church is useless, a church doesn't help. And so 20 million people have walked away from the house of God. And Christianity in and of itself, so in this nation, 66% of the people of this nation would confess to be Christian, 66%. There's no way we have 66% 66 living Christ-like. There's no way, right? It would look a lot different if we had 66% fully inflamed, spirit-filled, Bible-carrying, 
sons and daughters of God who are fully persuaded that death nor life nor principalities nor powers or nothing's going to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but yet not I, but Christ is the one living in me. That gets up every morning and says, you're dying today, flesh. You're not going to touch and handle, look at that, talk about that. Oh, help me, Jesus. Six. 66%, but out of the 66%, 6% of Christianity has what is called a, a biblical world view. Syncretism has taken over. Syncretism is where we uh, amalgamate, bring into, draw into other emotional and philosophical thoughts, and we incorporate them into our Christianity. We are a melting pot of belief. That's why... We can justify sinful behavior under the context of love. Well, they love one another. Well, you love ice cream too. And it's not helping. Just. <laughs> when you mix the gospel with anything, in Paul's words, it becomes another gospel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not the gospel, and there's only one gospel that can save. Yes, sir. I heard Piers Morgan say out of his own mouth, he said, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Christian, but some of the Bible is ridiculous. Think of that. I'm not throwing shade at Piers. He said that publicly, but the fact of the matter is he can say it because he's not alone. We are truly living in what the Bible predicts as perilous times. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 says this, but know this, that in the last days, going to have a lot of conversations about this, perilous times will come. For men, here's how you identify it. Here's how you identify perilous times. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And if you want to know the audience in which he's referring to, you have to read the next verse, having a form of godliness but denying, the, but denying its power. And then here's the encouragement. If you know anybody like that, run from them. He's not talking to the lost world acting like this. He's talking to people that confess one thing but deny the work of the Holy Spirit to prune you and to purge you. Are you hearing me? He's, he's not talking to a Pentecostal church to refer to the Methodist church because they don't let spiritual gifts operate. That's not what he's saying. Denying the power means you don't let the Holy Spirit take the word of God and wash you and cleanse you and break you free from all of those characters and conditions. And the moment that you shut his voice of correction down, you start living in the context of perilous times and you're the problem in perilous times. And the reason why you become the problem because you're not an asset in the hands of God to reach the world that is around you because you're a part of the problem. False teachings have destabilized the body of Christ. We are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, Ephesians 4.14. Do you know why this is? Compromise. Compromise is why. The church is living in compromise. Yes, sir. Period. Last year, I got into a a frustrated place as being pastor here and I told my wife I said I'm resigning from the church I said I just can't take it anymore I said I'm not leading the church I'm managing the church the church is leading me I said one of the things I love about our church is all of its diversity it's all its uniqueness it's, yeah. it's, it's what makes us mosaic that's what a mosaic is right Broken pieces from all kinds of different lives coming together and forming a beautiful picture. And so is the kingdom of God. But I'd gotten to a place that I had to, I had to filter everything that I wanted to say that is truth based upon colors of skin, political affiliations, economic situations and settings. I had to be very cautious with my words so you didn't get offended. And things felt so fragile. And I said, listen, the world is falling apart and I'm sitting in silence worried about the church falling apart. 
And I was like, I think I'm going to quit and start me a podcast. That's what I said. I'm going to start a podcast and I'm going to just unleash on the unholiness that is taking place within the church. I've always been good about that, but lately I've been quiet about that. And I'm no longer trying to filter the truth of God's word based upon your preference and your acceptability. It's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. Yeah. So my wife slapped me back into reality. She said, did God say so? I said, no, but I want to. She's... So welcome. In the modern culture, purpose has been redefined by platform. We don't even call this a pulpit anymore. This is a platform where we get to get up and display our gifts. We don't call altars any longer as places to come die. Text saved to the number on the screen. Say this prayer. No, the call of acceptance to Jesus is the willingness to die to yourself. And we have left off, we don't even call this a sanctuary anymore. We want you to be comfortable coming in. So get your coffee and your slice of pizza, dig through your bag of candy. This is an auditorium. We don't have to reverence this space. I can just get up and move around anytime I want. I'm going after my cotton, going to break out cotton candy before long. No, we're not, but you know what I mean. Success is based on budget and attendance. Fruit is now social media followers and views of your last short video. Gifts have become compensators for character. Technology is used for creating atmosphere and experience because we have no anointing. So we have to manipulate your emotions because we haven't been laying in the presence of God to get anything worthwhile to come break the yoke off of your life. So we want to help. You're going to want me to have a vacation after this. People are more impressed with our presentation than they are our substance. No, we are building on sand, church. We are building on sand, and Jesus was right to call us to the carpet of, of how we know the difference. Matthew chapter 7, verse 26 and 27 says, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. I've got his word. What determines wise and foolish is application. A foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was the fall. It means that you can live your life laboring to build something that looks good, but when the shaking comes, it will not stand within the shaking, because the only thing that makes it stand is the proper application of Jesus' words to our life, being practiced effectively and efficiently, and here you go, faithfully. We, we've been manipulating scripture to support our ideas of growing a church. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 22 says, To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by some means save some. So we have cool little phrases, this, that will we do anything short of sin to see people saved. It's been something that I've said out of my own mouth before, right? It sounds good. It sounds noble. Sounds like it's aimed right. But think of the terminology. I'll get right up to the line of sin and do anything I can. Yeah. That's not what God is calling us to be. Are you, so we've got to create programs that don't look sinful in order to attract you into our new Kiwanis Club or Civic Tan or Christian Club. Hmm. Profanity and alcohol are the new norm in the body of Christ. 41% of followers of Jesus today drink alcohol consistently. We got new churches being named Bruise and Bible. Bruise and Bible Community Church. What? It's Orlando's new premier destination for brewery. 
Yeah, it's true. It, it, it's true. The pastor stated this, and I quote, we are here to sell beer and stay afloat as a business. Oh, good for you. But the idea is that we can gather a bunch of people together. Well, there's a lot of people that like to drink who would otherwise not show up at our door if we just started a regular church here. <laughs> it seemed to work in the book of Acts. It seemed to have worked for 2,000 years here and there. Church in Tulsa had a similar plan when they announced Beer and Him Sunday. I mean, sometimes you just like to punch somebody right in the mouth. It's just like, <laughs> what? Because I have no spirit to pour into your emptiness, so I have to get you drunk on something to dull your senses so you can't figure out what's going on around here. Now, I'm not here to argue whether drinking alcohol is right or wrong, but I will tell you this flat out. You can't be on my staff and drink alcohol. No, 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 no. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke dope. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are, 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 are you hearing what I'm saying? No, 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 because we're raising a different standard. Glory to God. Alcohol in this itself might not bother you, but what comes out of you after you've had a few, it bothers everything in the work of God. And the moment that you try to justify yourself slamming some shots down or having you a little wine with your steak, you probably followed that with some pain pills just to up the ante of what was its effect. I'm coming today. I've already apologized to your guests. What do you want me to do? It's, Here's what the pastor said in Tulsa. If it takes serving beer in the small groups that leads a non-believer to Christ, it is worth swallowing our pride. You're not supposed to swallow your pride. You're supposed to get delivered from it and, and, and take a gulp of change. Listen, I don't mind saying that with the word of God right behind me. That is stupid. If the gospel won't change nobody, a glass of beer is not going to change anybody either. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Help me, Jesus. We have designated any spiritual gift activity into a, small, a few small groups that are for the real hungry and we've created doctrine for everybody else that says the spiritual gifts are no longer available, completely neglecting 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. I, we have lost our ability in the church as a whole to navigate a spiritual movement under the direction of the Holy Spirit. I was in a church planting conference with church planters, church planters, and leadership. And the worship leader was in a moment of pouring his heart out. And man, you can just feel the Spirit of God in the room. And it was like it was, we was building to something that seemed very prophetic and very profound in the moment. And then all of a sudden, the MC comes out in his skinny jeans, and his spiked hair with his good-looking self and his hot-looking wife and starts cracking jokes because he didn't have any spiritual wherewithal to recognize what was happening in the spirit and he was just sticking to the script trying to be funny. Now listen, I'm not against skinny jeans. I'm not going to wear them, but I'm not against skinny jeans, right? And I, I believe in looking good, thank you. And I have a hot wife, praise the Lord. So, uh, but that's immaterial. But because we're such a material people, we think spiking our hair, putting on cool clothing, appeals to the masses. John the Baptist was in camel skin, eating locusts and wild honey, crying out in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. And everybody ran out to the wilderness. What if we set our hearts on fire and say, God, burn with, burn within us. After last week's message, I said, we're going to lose some people through this season. We're going to be pruned in this house through this season. And a friend of mine told me, he said, for every one that goes, God's going to send five behind them. Because... I heard, I'm just, I got a lot to say. I heard out of his mouth. So I'm not, I'm not, what I'm sharing with you here is not hearsay or secondhand information. I heard a preacher say this. He said, I got up this morning. And he says, man, I just had a hard time connecting with the Lord this morning. And I put on some worship, and it just wasn't doing it for me. And I just couldn't find my groove this morning. 
Now, he's on the platform telling this to his church on Sunday morning. He says, so I put it in some Metallica to get in the mood. <laughs> what? I had to get some Metallica to connect with Jesus. Well, that's stupid. There's not a problem with the worship song. There's a problem with the heart. Meaning the worship wouldn't move the heart. So it wasn't the song that was a problem. The heart was desiring something different. I don't care. How do you tell people who are living in their brokenness, get you some Metallica in the morning and maybe that'll get you going. Help us, Jesus. We've made Sunday mornings all about getting lost people saved. Meanwhile, saved people have drifted. And we are under threat, Judges chapter 2, verse 10, to repeat something. It says, when all that generation that had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know their Lord, nor the work which he had done for all of Israel. If we're not careful, we're going to lose this next generation by playing church and not being the church, not living to the standard in which God... Th listen, this generation behind us needs a spirit-filled church who is completely sold out, who doesn't have a bunch of antics that we're trying to pull off to make them socially accepted but we weaponize them and cultivate them. It is possible, Israel, to be in the promised land with all the provisions around you and you be hostage to the Philistines. That's the way Israel found themselves. They had made it to the promised land. They had made it to the place that God had called them, but the Bible says there wasn't a sword in the hand of all of Israel. And you know why there wasn't no sword? Because the Philistines took the smiths out of the land. They wouldn't let nobody that knew how to take a rough piece of iron and put it in the fire and hammer that thing out until it got an edge. And there's no swords in the hands of the body of Christ anymore. We got our platitudes. We got our TikTok videos. We got our little social slogans. And we need to stick this generation into the fire and get the hammer of God's word and beat an edge on them. So this... Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Oh no, we, 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 we have gone the way of Balaam. I told you recently, I said, listen, I need the pew to push the pulpit. Yeah. I'm begging you in this season, don't let compromise stand in this place. If you start feeling us adjusting to the wind of this culture and compromising the truth of what you know, the truth to make people feel good about being wrong, you need to leave this church and go find you a Bible-believing, spirit-filled church that will not live in compromise because you can't afford to waste your life. Sit. Oh, yeah. God will not save a lost, dying world with a lost, dying church. Secret sin is being exposed like never before. Who knew Cat Williams was a prophet? Well. By the way, I don't advocate listening to him, by the way. But somebody shared a clip from an interview with Shannon Sharp. And Cat Williams says 2024 is the year of exposure. And he named names. He said, I don't care in the church, out of the church. This is going to be a time of exposure. And man, we're seeing it. And it's just not limited to a, the, the Catholic church, by the way. No, no. Throw all your stones at them. The Catholic church has spent $4 billion paying for the molestation of generations. $4 billion 15,000 people have raised concerns of sexual abuse by, by the people they should trust the most. Four billion. Where did they get that money? It's people's gift to God. And now because we have impurity in the pulpit, we have to use tithe and offerings to pay off people that have been broken by leadership rather than running leadership off the podium and off the platform. And say, no, 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 we, homie, don't play. Right. The leader of the National Association of Evangelicals was doing this. He was breaking up painkillers and snorting them. And then sleeping with a male prostitute. Crushing painkillers. Oh, I've done that before. Snorting them. N not since 98. 
Let me be clear. Let me be clear. Not since the day I got saved. Church is paying off families who have been violated with the tithes and offerings that belong to God. Pastors have groomed young men with lavish gifts from tithe and offerings in order to seduce young men to carry them off on extravagant trips only to molest them in the hotel rooms listening to those young men year later said I can't get the smell of his cologne off my body no matter how much I scrub a recent pastor is resigning from his church and he wants to admit to a 20-year affair after his resignation that after he says I, I had an affair 20 years ago and he's telling his congregation and he's resigning and he's working on some things 20 years later should have done it the next day, but 20 years later, and he's acting like that was, a, that was just a, a, a polite affair until the young lady stands up in the congregation listening to him lie to the people as the people applaud him as he's exiting the, the platform, and she goes up to the platform, and she says, no, let me give you the story right. I was 16, and it was on your office floor. What? 16-year-old on the office floor of the pastor where's the fear of the Lord it be like he gonna kill me now I'm coming the recent things being discovered this is a time of discovering this is why this message is important pastors that we love and emulate and listen to have been influenced all of a sudden we're finding out that they 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 have a history of molesting 12 year old girls and just not a one-time incident but over a period of years that's predatorial that's not a weak moment it's predatory it's calculated the guy that was leading what was called the fastest growing church in american history in four years a church went from zero to twelve thousand members had an affair with his therapist I, I usually don't like to throw names out. You're going to know some of these people anyway. But the therapist's name, I couldn't get past. This is public knowledge. Ratchet of porn, Thongaram. I mean, was God talking? I mean, when you got porn and thong in your name, <laughs> that ought to be a way mark. Are you hearing me? That ought to be saying something right there. But instead, when you get caught, you leave your family and your kid in the brokenness of that, abandon your responsibilities, and you go marry her. We've made celebrities out of unholy people. A recent pastor stands and tells his congregation that he had some sinful conduct in the last few years, and he, he's resigning his church. Or not resigning, he's taking a step away to deal with his sin. I listen because I'm following because it's my responsibility to be apprised. I listened to the conversation of his elders addressing the church on the following Sunday, and I was incredibly disappointed. As the elders stood before the church, he says, I know all of you are wanting an update, you're wanting to hear something, but I just got one word for you. Everything is going to be all right. I thought everything is not all right. And don't throw a religious platitude at me and deflect the conversation because you're trying to cover for the man of God. Everything's not all right. Yes, God's in control, and everything will ultimately be all right, but this situation all right. Don't think that a few months away, you... yeah, yeah, yeah. a very well-known preacher, if I told you his name, he, this is what the guy does. This is, this is the leadership in the body of Christ, guys. This is the influence. This is books you're buying. The guy takes his wife. He's traveling out of town. He takes his wife to a hotel, and he also takes his mistress. He checks in the hotel, buys his mistress a room down the hall. Down the hall. In the middle of the night, he gets up and leaves the bed of his wife, goes down the hall, and gets in the bed with the mistress. Who does that? Who who does that? And then his church on Sunday is still packed. And people are shouting him down. Because they don't care about his character. They only care about his presentation. Are you... What? What kind of man is that? That ain't a man of God. That's a pretender and a player that is manipulating the body of Christ for platform and money and notoriety. He's a sheep in wolf's clothing. 
Are you, I said he's a sheep in wolf's clothing, devouring the body of Christ and saying to everybody in the room that is shouting him down that it's okay for you to do it as well. Come on, I'm coming to tell you if your preacher got a mistress, you need to run that joker right off the platform and say you need to sit down in this place. You need to take a seat, glory to God. I ain't got to hear nothing from you. What are you going to give me? If it ain't changed you, it ain't changing me either. Oh, I'm coming today. I said, I'm coming today. We got our bishops twerking at P. Diddy. P. Diddy. P. Diddy's party. What business do you have being in such an ungodly place? Have you lost your mind? And don't you dare disrespect the call of God to get up in front of the people and say, well, if I've done anything wrong, all I have to do is repent. The devil is a liar and so is his mother-in-law. Are you hearing me? You don't justify that kind of leadership by, by getting up in this place and saying to the people, sin all you want. Go to all the parties that you want and just ask God to forgive you later. And you know what the problem is? The problem's the pew too. Because when he said that, guess what everybody did? Say it, Bishop! Say it! Say it, Bishop! I'll be like, let's go. If he's staying, I'm leaving. I don't care how gifted of a gift a person has. You have nothing spiritually to put in me. And you're just functioning on gifting. Your character is long left. Yeah. All right now. Listen to a man say, I told you I'm coming today. I'm, all, I'm, I'm giving it to you because it's a problem. Hopefully I got a solution at the end of this. Heard him out of his own mouth. Pastor cheats on his wife. Gets his mistress pregnant. I promise you, if, that, if I did that, you'd be like, where's Pastor? <laughs> you'd be like, where are Pastor Daly at? Pastor Julia would be like, I don't know. I ain't seen him. I ain't seen him. She would have dug a hole. Come looking for me. I promise. Come looking for me. Because she's going to kill me. But I listened to him get in the pulpit after his wife has filed divorce and he has a pregnant mistress and he pulls out 2 Samuel and he preaches a message on David and Bathsheba. And his closing exhortation was, is that David was still God's man and he's still God's man. Looking at somebody else's sin and justifying his sinful behavior and say, I have a right to be here because David kept, God kept David. Well, you listen, the Messiah is not coming out of your loins. Something else is coming out and it ain't godly. We're in a shaking church. We're in a shaking when pro-choice pastors stand in the pulpit and advocate for abortion. Can you imagine standing before God one day as a pastor and you've led your church to believe that it's all right to pull babies from the womb of a mother? Who? Where is the fear of the Lord? Where is the fear of the Lord? And listen, if you're offended by what I've said thus far, you're in great company. Matthew chapter 15, verse 12 and 14 says this. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard what you were saying? You know what Jesus was like? I don't care. They search land and sea to make one convert, and they make that convert more the devil of hell than they are themselves. That's what Jesus said. He said they're like they're like whited sepulchers. They look uh, sepulchers. They look good on the outside, but they're full of dead men's bones. Jesus wasn't holding back. There's too much at stake to be polite with sin, especially when he's going to be brutally beaten and hung on a cross for it. Right? Shall I continue in sin that grace may be abound? How shall I continue in sin any longer if I am dead to sin? The problem in the church is we haven't died to sin yet. And there needs to be a mass killing of the sin nature in the body of Christ in this season. And this shaking that has come has been given by God to shake us loose. This nature. Hmm. 
Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that some's going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. I'm getting to my close, but I want to add some, some other thoughts that are just startling to hear. These are influencers. I didn't get down to the smaller churches across this country that are rife with misconduct and abuse of kids. Rife. These are the most prominent people. In, in, in Atlanta, a megachurch pastor said this, we need a new gospel for grown-ups. Then he says this, and I quote, I had a Zoom with all my singles just this week. I'm talking about thousands of members. I had a Zoom with my singles just this week. For me to tell 16-year-olds to be celibate is one thing, but a 37-year-old who's used to getting some, I need a different kind of gospel. What? What about the part that says all fornicators and adulterers are going to hell? I need a different kind of gospel. You can give a different kind of message, but it doesn't become a different kind of gospel. There's only one gospel, and it is Jesus Christ, and he has set the standard for what is holy and righteous. We got preachers saying we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. What? We need to unhitch from the Old Testament, and we need to quit saying your Bible says. We need to unhitch from the Old Testament. The Bible says clearly that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if it's any of God's word, it's all God's word. And I need to tell you in this season, let me quote C.C. Winans for you, if you don't mind. She said, if it don't sound like God, it's not God. If it don't look like God, it's not God. If it don't sound or look like God, you should run from it and find something that looks and sounds just like God. We need some runners in this season that are not shouting the gift down, but are... The Bible says, when the Spirit of the Lord comes in he will lift up a standard against the enemy in this season we need some standard bearers who will pick back up the standard of what it looks like to be a fully devoted follower of jesus and get on the forefront when judah marched they had a tribe on their standard the warriors followed the standard our ability to win is not in our capabilities to fight it's in the standard in which we march under it's the banner in which we gather under if we try to do this in our flesh people lose moses couldn't hold he couldn't hold the standard up on his own. So we had to call a few people. Come here, Mr. Allen. Come, come, come. Come here, Pastor Tommy. Here, here's the church in the season. Girl. Boy. We got our standard down. When Moses' standard was down because he wasn't able to hold it up, guess what happened? The people lost their lives. And when you and I let the standard drop, guess what? Let me be as plain as I can. People go to hell. They die lost. The revelation of Jehovah Nisi comes to Moses. In a time of weakness, in a time of shaking, as he's watching people die, and he's struggling to live up to the standard. But God sent some people, an Aaron and a Hur. And the Bible says, you know what? So they stayed his arms. They stayed his arms. But that's not only, only what he done. You know what it said? He sat on the rock. He positioned himself in rest, and he held up the standard, and he got help from brothers to hold him accountable. You're not dropping that, Moses. We're not letting lies be lost. No, hold it up. Hold it up. Joshua's winning. They're getting off drugs. Marriages are getting healed. Hey, are you hearing me? We got to wave the standard again over this place. Oh, that we would lift up the standard. And the promise.
is, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. No, there's a shaking happening, but I can tell you one thing that's going to stand when it's over. It's the standard of Jesus. He's been fighting for his church for 2,000 years. And he's going to shake it. But that that can remain will remain. Come on, stand to your feet. Woo! 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 Come on, just, just, just be with me this morning. Are you holding the standard? Are you living up to the sacrifice that was so gracefully given you? Or has sin become a light thing for you? Oh, God don't care. He loves me anyway. Jesus said to the church, he said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Yes. God says there's seven things I hate. Right. God does not love sin. Let me bring it home for you. You say, well, he loves the sinner. That's what we say all the time. Uh-huh. But we say it as a way of excusing behavior. Yes. But unrepentant sinners... He'll give judgment and not mercy. God's looking for some standard bearers. Who's going to set the standard? Who's going to hold it in this season? That God can take the standard of your life and draw people to himself. You ain't got to have no cute practices. You ain't got to have no gimmicks. You don't have to have a bunch of subscribers to your YouTube to win this generation. You don't have to be famous on TikTok to win this generation. A matter of fact, the problem with people falling is we made celebrities out of the gift. And we held no accountability to the character. But not in this season. N- not in this season. And we're going to lift the standard. And we're going to say what needs to be said. And we're going to be like Jesus. We're going like, we're gonna, we're gonna to be like John the Baptist. I'm not letting Herod steal his brother's wife and sit up here and think he's okay I'm going to go tell him he's done wrong yeah. let, me help you under, let me help you understand something touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm that becomes the excuse that we use but don't touch that anointing if he's going down the hallway he don't have any anointing no, he doesn't. Right. No, right. you only get oil from intimacy with God Well, I don't want to put, put my word on him. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't, don't touch the man of God. What? That scripture was given because of God's protection on Abraham when he was wandering through a land filled with giants. He wasn't superimposing that on everybody that picks up the Bible and proclaims the truth. He wasn't saying, no, Jesus said, you're going to suffer, you're going to be persecuted, they're going to take, and, and some of you are going to get killed for it. It's a misapplication. I need the pew to push the pulpit to make sure that we're holding the standard because your kids are desperate that we do it. Are you hearing me?